I guess I should apologize. I know many of you were here to see John Dodowski, so just so you know, my name is John Dodowski. <laughs> um, I, I guess Coach Dodowski had either an issue with travel or uh, something family going. So uh, Jody Martin reached out to me. So the first thing I do need to do is apologize. Um, this was not something that I was prepared to do at 12 o'clock this morning when we were getting ready to walk out to the field for practice. So um, this has been put together very quickly. I need to really thank Tim. Uh, this is Tim Obransky. He's our director of the cross operations at Hopkins. Tim was great when we got the call. Um, I told him, listen, we need, we need to put something together. We need to put it together fast. Um, We've done some of this stuff, obviously, and Tim was able to pull pieces of uh, past presentations together and then obviously add a few that pertain to our current team. But without his help, this, this presentation doesn't happen. So, Tim, I really uh, I appreciate your hard work. Um, I'll apologize for not shaving. I was lucky enough to be able to run home, grab a suit. Uh, so we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to fly by the seat of our pants a little bit and do the very best we can. It's not hard to talk about your culture. Um, that is one thing that every coach should know. Um, and it's something that we at Johns Hopkins take very seriously. Um, we don't want to just build a culture. We want to build a championship culture. So before I kind of get into this, I want to give you a little bit of background. Uh, 16 years ago, I, uh, I received a call from Tom Calder, who is now the current athletic director at Johns Hopkins. I happen to be on the golf course with a, with a, with a good friend. And uh, if you've ever seen me golf, you'll know I'm better at driving the car than I am at hitting the golf ball. And it was a long conversation about my interest in coming back to Hopkins. And obviously, it was a chance for me to go home. When we got back, and when I took over, my first order of business was to hire the right staff. And this is where I want to start. We needed to hire not just great coaches, but we needed to hire people that were better people than they were coaches. And that was where our culture started, was hiring the right guys. I felt like I needed guys that were going to march to the beat that I marched to, that the things that were important to me were important to them. The importance of character in a player was as important to them. The importance of discipline was the same to them. I needed someone when I wasn't there and, and also when I was there to carry that same message. So that was the first order of business. And at the time, I wanted guys that were very, very familiar with Johns Hopkins University. Uh, so I hired Seth Tierney, who many of you know, head coach at Hofstra, has done a great job, now uh, going to be an assistant coach with Team USA. I wanted people that knew Johns Hopkins University. I wanted people that had a passion for that institution, but also for the lacrosse program. And, and I wanted guys that would be willing to invest. And quite frankly, I wanted guys that were, would be willing to fight some battles. Because we knew we needed to fight some battles early on to change a culture. So when I took over, sometimes you got to take a step back to take a step forward. So I took over a program that had been successful a year before I uh, had played in the, uh, I believe, in the Final Four, and uh, had, I'm sorry, had, had played in the, in, the, in, the, in the quarterfinals, and it had some success. And John Hawes did a very good job. But we wanted to do things differently, and in order to do that, we really had to draw a line in the sand. And uh, as you all know, kids, young people, are different today than they were when many of us were growing up. I know they're very different than I, I was. And sometimes it's really difficult to look back and say, well, this is how I would have looked at it. They don't look at it that way. They don't put a dime in a phone to make a phone call. They just press a button and hit send. It's a di much different young person today. So when we started, we needed to really kind of figure out what is, what is it that we want to do here. And we decided that we didn't want to build a culture. We wanted to build a championship culture. And we wanted to get Johns Hopkins back to the Final Four and help them win a national championship. So the question was how to do that. One, you hire the right staff. We were going to have to make some tough decisions. We were going to have to push some guys out. 
We were going to have to embrace some other guys. We were going to have to hopefully take some young guys and help them change in order to fit our culture. This is all aside from the lacrosse component. Because when you take over a team, as many of you know, you have a certain offense you want to run, defense you want to run, man up, man down, ride clear. But all those guys don't necessarily fit that vision. And a good coach is going to take the players that he has and tweak whatever he wants to do and have them have something that fits them. So we had a lot of changing to do. I'll be as forthright as I can be with you today. We had to change drinking. We had to change the approach to strength and conditioning. We had to change the approach to, to uh, conditioning. We had to change the approach to nutrition. We had to change the approach to academics. So these are all big things to tackle. And I needed guys that were gonna, were gonna fight those battles for me. So the first thing we did was we came up with a set of core values. And uh, if you can hit that, these are our core, core values for this season. Our core, core values change. And you might say, well, coach, how, how does something that's important to your core change? Well, your team changes. And the young men that are in that team change. What they're good at, what they're not good at, where the problems <coughs> lie, where the weaknesses are, where the strengths are. So we sat down and we came up with, with a group of core values. And, and the first one is, is pretty simple, is character. That has been a core value since the day we arrived on campus. We did not want to recruit young men. We did not want to coach young men. We did not want to work with young men that didn't have character. So when we're looking for that, well, you have to define what's character. So we define character as what you do and doing the right things when no one's watching. Now, in today's day and age in recruiting, that's a bear to figure out when you're recruiting a 14-year-old ninth grader that if they're anything like my kids, don't pick their underwear up from behind the bathroom door. They don't drive, they don't shake, and now I have to figure out their character. That has become one of the biggest challenges of the early recruiting. But that has remained the core of our program, is character. We want guys with good character. We want guys that are gonna do the right things on a Friday night, that aren't gonna create issues and force me to get a phone call on Monday morning. If you got the right character guys, then you can focus on the things that you need to focus on when you're out on the field or in the film. You can focus on the cross. Distractions destroy teams. And we talk about noise, avoid the noise. And these are, you know, guys that don't have good character, guys that create issues, create noise for your program. Um, I'm sure at the high school level, sometimes it's difficult. You don't get to recruit your players, but you sure get to, you sure get to decide who's on your team, and you sure get to decide what the culture of your team is going to be. And at the end of the day, I really think young men today, even though they're different than maybe many of us were when we grew up, I think they want to be in a structured environment. So here I sit today talking to you. My speech is probably a thousand times different than John Donowski's. Because if you look at John on TV and you look at me, I got a vein that you know pops out when I yell. I don't think I've ever seen John yet. Our approach is different. And your approach has to fit your program, and it has to fit your personality. So your values, what you're looking for, the culture you're trying to develop, can't be the culture that works for the high school down the road, or the high school that's won 10 championships. That might not work at your place. So this is just one of the things we felt. Number two, at least this year, is selflessness. And again, the words change from year to year. We think we've got to be less selfish. We've got to give more to, our, to, to each other. We talk about our guys, they talk all the time about their best friends. So my best friend is a guy that I'm not going to tell him what he wants to hear. I'm going to tell him what he needs to hear. So you can't have a team of guys that are just going to tell one another what they want to hear, okay? So we need guys that are selfless, that are willing to say, you know what? This may put me in a bad position. This guy might not like it. But I need to tell him, hey, you can work a little harder. Now, the way you deliver the message is certainly up to you. 
but we needed guys to be selfless. Little details, this never changes. To build a championship culture, to build an appropriate culture, you gotta be about little details. For us, it's hitting a line in a spring. For us, it's leaving a locker room clean. Here's an interesting tidbit. I know if our team's gonna be any good or not by the way our locker room looks. Now that may sound as foolish as foolish can be, but if I go in there at night and our locker room is a mess, I know we got problems. Because I know our team doesn't take enough pride to follow the little details. The little details are you leave a place better than you found it. The little details are you hang your hat here, your helmet goes there, your other helmet goes there, your clubs go here, your arm pads go there. Not really hard, especially when it's the diagram is drawn up on the board for you. <laughs> but kids don't always do it. So the guys that don't do it, the guys that have the sloppy lockers, well, how are they going to know the intricacies of our defense? How are they going to know our offense? And how are they going to pay attention to the little details within them that help us to be successful? So details, kind of like a non-negotiable, just like character. It's a non-negotiable. And the other one we picked this year was toughness. So I don't know if any of you have ever worked with the program. Has anybody ever done that in here? Had their team work with the program? We just worked with them. Had a great experience with those guys. Uh, they're Navy Marines and they work on team building and leadership development. I learned a lot. You know, we all think we, we know a lot. Well, the things that they do pertain to life and death. And it's amazing what I learned from those guys. And, and what I learned about our team was we need to be tougher. We need to be mentally tougher and physically tougher. So in order to follow little details, you know what? It takes a little bit of toughness. You come in after practice, you're exhausted, tired, looking forward to getting something to eat. You want to go see your girlfriend or whatever you want to get out of. Just get out of the locker room and head home. So, ah, uh, you know what, I'll get it later, I'll leave it. That's not mentally tough. So, for us to develop this core, th th this championship culture, we had to develop some core values. Like I said, these change year in and year out. Sometimes we may have a team that we feel is very unselfish already. So we don't have to make selfless a core value. We know we already have it. We know we don't really need to talk about it a lot. So another thing we did, go to the next slide, Tim, is we did this last year, and, and I gotta tell you, given what we dealt with last year, I'm so thankful that we did this. Um, we went over and we talked about our team metal. All these qualities, all these things that we're showing you here help define our culture, all right? And what team metal stands for is a mission essential task list. So what, we do, what we'll do with every team, and we'll do our one this year very soon, is we'll get together with them, we'll sit down for a couple hours, and we break up the team into groups of eight, put them at different tables, and the team, the team itself talks about the things that they think are critical to our success, and what words describe those things. So once they decide, they can come up with five words that they think are five things that they think are critical to our success, we'll bring a representative up from each table. They'll get up like I'm in front of you today, and they'll say, here's our five words, and they'll explain how and why they came to those five words. Once we've gone through all the tables, we'll kind of cross-reference and we'll see what ones are, what one is repeated multiple times, and we'll kind of put that off to the side. And then we'll talk about the words that aren't repeated or we'll talk about the words that kind of, it's a different word, but it has the same meaning as another word. And we'll try to find out which word makes sense. What we're trying to help these guys do is have a hand in our culture, to be responsible. If they're part of it, if they have a hand in it, then it's gonna be more important to them. So once we go through those groups, we have the guys come up, then I'll get up on a board just like this, and I'll begin to facilitate. And I'll say, okay, we've got these 14 words. How do you feel about this one? How important is this one? And then we'll start to cross, cross off different words. Or, well, you know what? That actually really means the same as the other word. But this is how we meant it. And this is what we came up with. At the end 
of three hours, we came up with 59. What does 59 mean? That meant our coaches, our team, our trainer, our strength and conditioning coach. We felt, our team felt, like the most important thing was the 59 people that were in that locker room game day. Those were the only people that mattered. And we were going to do everything for those 59. Trust. Felt like we couldn't do anything if we didn't trust one another. They needed to trust the coaches. The coaches needed to trust the players. And most importantly, the players needed to trust each other. We needed to be fearless. No matter what the odds, no matter what the situation, we had to believe we could overcome it. So we had to play with no fear. Sometimes when you're, you're at a place where there's pressure, you can play not to lose, rather than play to win. At Johns Hopkins, we're expecting to win. We don't win, there's quite a few opinions out there. It's what makes the job great. Rather be somewhere where they care than where they don't care. But when you don't win and you're in a place where it's important, you hear about it. And now all of a sudden you start playing not to lose, rather than playing to win. So fearless was the word they came up with. Passionate. We got to be passionate. We got to want to be there. Too often you feel like guys are doing things because they have to do them, not because they want to do them. We want a group of guys that want to do it. They felt the same way. So they felt like passionate was a, an important word. And then grip. Sometimes you hear in hockey terms, a team is a sandpaper team. You know, they're like sandpaper. They're tough, they're gritty, tough to ruffle their feathers. We felt like we had to play with grit. We had to play with a level of toughness, both mental and physical. So this thing you see here was on a board outside our locker room. Every day they walked in, they were reminded of the words they chose. And that's really important. It weren't the words the coaches chose, it was the words they chose. They were reminded of what they wanted our culture to be like. And I don't know if many of you know what happened to our team last year. Uh, we tragically lost a young man, quite frankly, this time of year, January 26th. Um, I got a phone call at 8 a.m. Obviously, I'm sure you can imagine what that phone call said. Hardest day of my life as a man. Hardest day of my life as a man. Can't imagine how hard it was for those young men, in particular the boys that were his roommates and the young man that found him. So I'm thankful that we've gone through this because I really believe our commitment to these things helped get us through a really challenging time. I would tell you if our culture wasn't what it is, we would have fell apart. We would have fell apart. And early in the season, we struggled. We struggled mightily. You know, and what do you say to a group of guys when they lose a game after they've lost a friend? You know, it's perspective. It's really not that big a deal. Even at Johns Hopkins, it's not that big a deal. So it was this that really defined our team. And we won, when we won the Big Ten Championship, we had this put on our end right here. Those, those, those five words. And we had a 19 placed on our ring, which was the boy who passed away, Jeremy, who was number. Our culture helped us through a really difficult time. If you don't have that culture, then maybe we struggle quite a bit more. Tim, next one. So the foundation that we tried to, to build our culture off, off of, well, we wanted to set standards of excellence. We didn't want to set standards of mediocrity. You know, we didn't want to say, well, yeah, you know, we'd like to win a few games. We made it simple. We wanted to be the best team that we could be. We don't talk in our locker room about winning national championships. We don't. We talk about the things it takes to win those, things, those, those games. We talked about the standard of excellence on, off the field. And I would tell you guys, ladies, these are not, this foundation isn't built just to help us win games. This is about the life skills that we're, in, we're required or I think we're responsible to help our, our players develop. 
At the end of the day, we want to help each guy become the best version of themselves that they can be. I tell every kid that sits in my office that, every mother and father that sits in my office, our goal is simple. We want to help your son become the best version of himself that he can be. The best person, the best student, and the best player. And make no mistake, it goes in that order. It absolutely goes in that order. So we wanted to set standards of excellence. Our goal, team 3.0. That is the goal for the team. You don't, you don't reach that goal, you don't do your part. Our guys know about it. We've competed by classes. What class got a 3-5? What class got a 3-2? What class fell below? Okay, we wanted to set a standard for them to follow. We wanted to set a standard of excellence in terms of behavior. Athletes are looked at very different on college campuses. How often do you guys open up the Baltimore Sun New York Post, Boston, but whatever paper it is, and on the inside of the first page of the sports section, all you're reading is about all the bad things the athletes did. Our goal was to, to create a standard of excellence so that our faculty knew that we were there to be students, that we knew we were there to be good people, and yeah, they knew we were there to, to, to be great, a great lacrosse team. So we established that standard of excellence. We wanted to build a complete student athlete. I'm certain if you're here tonight, listen, weather's lousy, you can be home. You're here to learn. I hope I eat something that, that we'll say tonight. Will, you can take one thing and go back and it will help your team. But we want to build a complete student athlete from what he is academically, what he is athletically, what he is emotionally. We talk all the time, and this translates to any level, any level. You got high school kids, well, you want to prepare them for the next level, and you want to help them build the foundation that's going to help them later on in life. And that's what our goal, we're teachers. So we've talked a lot about building a complete student athlete. Emotionally is a big component. It's amazing, you all know this, it's amazing some of the baggage that these young men and women bring with them in today's day and age. I mean, honestly, I wouldn't want to be that. It's hard being a teenager now. I think it's a hell of a lot harder than it was when I was growing up. Everything you do, there's a picture of it. Anything you said is repeated and sent out to cyberspace. Any mistake you make is documented on Twitter. We have to protect our kids from themselves sometimes. So we wanted to build a complete student athlete, nutritionally, emotionally, physically, okay, and then obviously academically. Relationships, right? maybe that's the word I should have started the whole thing with because it, the bottom line is this whole thing is about relationships. Um, we all have mentors and, and, and I have a great one in Bill Tierney. Obviously, we're, it's well documented what he's done.